Hey, it's Mark Podolsky of The Land Geek with the favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And on this week's Art of Passive Income podcast, I'm going to put on my anchorman voice. He's a big deal. Joe Stolte is a former Inc. 500 entrepreneur and not three-time, not four-time, five-time technology founder with successful exits, including Lottery.com, which went public for $526 million, and Growflow, which sold for $62.5 million. Today, Joe is CEO of Daily.ai. And I know all you AI geeks right now, like all of a sudden your, your ears just perked up. Yeah, that's right. CEO of an AI company that helps brands and thought leaders publish AI automated email no- newsletters that produce 40 to 60% open rates. I'll say that again. 40 to 60% open rates in less than five minutes a week, all without writing a single piece of content. Daily AI produces AI newsletters for thought leaders such as Peter Diamandis, Joe Polish, Dan Sullivan, JJ Virgin, Cameron Harold, Chris Voss, and other brands I know you've heard of in 20 different industries. Today, Joe is going to tell you about how his business uses AI to get incredible results in marketing along with several powerful mental models you can use to effectively embrace AI as a business owner or investor. Joe Stolte, welcome. I was also, um, you can also add world's longest bio to my list of accolades because, you know, I'm really going for that. Look, I, I don't think it's, you know, I've had longer. Oh, man. all right. You know, when, when you're impressive like that, it's a great bio. And, but I'd, I'd love to just rewind the tape with the technology, building companies, selling companies. Like, how do you see the world of business and technology? Like, what drives you? Because to be a founder is really hard. To do it five times is really hard. And now you're on your, your sixth. Yeah, I think a good place to drop in is to understand like my personality, just so we can frame the rest of the conversation. I'm incredibly competitive with myself. I'm not very competitive with other people, but I'm very competitive with myself. And so if I do very poorly at something, I want to master it. And so, you know, the very I left corporate America and raised money and started my first technology company and uh, and it imploded. And I lost a lot of people's money. And, uh, you know, I, I figured out what I was good at and what I wasn't good at. And like, mostly it was a lot of things I wasn't good at. I thought like, oh, this big business stuff I learned at like Microsoft would, would translate to a startup. And theoretically it does, but man, when the rubber meets the road, it does not. But I was, you know, I, I was hooked because like, I was like, look, if I fail badly at something, I really want to figure it out. And so I think that was where I resigned to just be a serial entrepreneur. Like I see business like a game. It's like a three-dimensional chessboard and I love it. And then, you know, some days are, are more stimulating or stressful than others, but I really enjoy it, you know, at this point. And for me, it's, it's about how do we take an idea, you know, galvanize it with capital, talent, and a compelling vision, and then just go and run and make it happen. And I just happened to fall into this groove where, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at taking ideas, scaling them, and then selling them. You know, it's never like, hey, we're going to build this and sell it. It's just we end up building it. And then along the way, the, the sale opportunity comes. So, and I just, I really enjoyed that part of the business. You know, it's fun. It's, 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 it's always something new every day and a new challenge every day. And it's not very stagnant. And, uh, you know, at this stage of my life, I'm still really enjoying it. So that's the backstory. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, so Joe, you know, you, I know you, you've worked with entrepreneurs, you're an entrepreneur, just given your, your vast knowledge, knowing what you know now, and you were talking to someone that wanted to do, let's say a startup in, oh, I don't know, a land investing business for passive income. (laughs) What would be your best advice to them? Yeah. My, there's two pieces of advice. They're related but these are mental models that have helped me as an entrepreneur and i use them all the time you know but axiomatically for our business but also pragmatically like on a on a day-to-day basis and the first one is make it work small and then go big like what can you prototype to de-risk it and, and you know for us that was like how do we package the idea and sell it before we even build it to see if there's a market for it Cause you know, why build something if there's no market there? And then if you know, there's a market there, yeah. then 
you got to ask yourself, what's the next assumption in my business that I need to validate and kind of think more like a scientist than a capitalist for five seconds and go, cool. Um, maybe it's the message market fit, or maybe it's like the first prototype and then to see if it actually works and it can get the results that you promise people and that kind of thing, but just make it work small, like chunk it down really, really small, like to one assumption, build a prototype, put it in front of real humans and see if they'll react to it and then adjust your behavior. And the faster you can do those things and prototype and go faster, it's not like fail forward a little bit. I don't like to call it failing. It's, it's like, you know, what was, was when we created the light bulb, we did 10,000 experiments. Was that failure or was that just moving forward to the next best iteration? I don't know. It's probably the way you frame it. But for me, it's like the first principle is make it work small and then go big. And this is a, this next one I think is helpful is um, whether you're an investor or you're trying to start a new business. And I learned this from Evan Pagan, who's now my business partner, but for many years was kind of like a digital mentor to me. And he said, uh, you got to have short-term pessimism and long-term optimism, meaning um, in the short term, just as most things don't work. You know, if you run an ad, it's not going to have a 51% conversion rate. It's going to have like, like the majority of people that see the ad are going to ignore it. It's just not going to be a slam dunk on the first shot. So use data right. and assume that it's not going to work and you need to get to version five, you know, and that, but, but, but at the same time, you know, keep that long-term optimism because some days are, some days are worse than others. It's difficult. It's very challenging and seems like nothing's working. And like a lot of things are falling apart at the same time where you're stressed out because you're spinning too many plates or thinking about too many things and you're more work than there are people to go around kind of a deal. Just have that long-term optimism. And as long as you hold that and you keep your feet moving in the direction of where you want to go, as long as you don't quit, it's inevitable that you'll get where you're going as long as you can live long enough. So those two principles are different, but related you know, the short-term pessimism, long-term optimism and make it work small and then go big. If all you took from this discussion was that, like you have very good raw material to be an excellent entrepreneur. I, yeah, I love that. And it's so true. I mean, there's, there was so much wisdom in what you said. And I remember, and I'm not great at it all the time. Like I, I'm a quick start on like Colby. And so I have all these ideas and my team's like, whoa, slow <laughs> down. Let's just do a small test. Yeah, You're probably wrong. I'm like, oh no, they want this. This is like, no, they probably want less than that. Like, I want to give, 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 and it's like, no, you're overwhelming. And so, um, but you know, to your point, like, even uh, when I started GeekPay.io, which is like our set and forget it uh, loan management software, I didn't build it. I just had the idea, and I just started pre-selling it to see, hey, would you put any money down? if this thing actually came to be and I would, I gave like an irresistible offer and they're like, yeah. And so I took that money I'm like, okay, I've got money now for a developer and then hired the developer and did it. And so it mitigated the risk. But when you think of like restaurants, like unless you're going to do like a ghost kitchen, it's really like, that's why most restaurants fail. They think, Oh, my food's the best. My location's great. I have staff. And like people come in like, no, not, no. not, not for me. Talk. Yeah, I think um, another thing that uh, it's like a yes and the, the, other, the other third principle, I think that's really important, especially in the early days, because in your example, it's like, hey, I collected cash up front and then I paid a developer. Well, if you followed my first few principles, but didn't know this third one, you could still pretty risky. You could like the developer could quit. You could run out of money. You'd have to pay your money yourself. The next one is that in the early days, like speed of execution trumps almost everything. Like you just got to go, you just got to make stuff, put it in front of people and iterate, and then do that more times faster with under the same budget. And if you can do that with more iterations than the next person in the marketplace, then the chances of your success go up pretty, pretty greatly. So yeah, that speed of execution is super important. And I guess the last thing now, else- now why do you say that? Because Joe, like, like some people, like I can imagine someone listening to this, like, well, what if my iteration, you know, it, it fails, like especially in software. And yeah. they want to be perfectionists and they don't want to, to iterate because they want to test QA and, and all that. Yeah. I think there's lots of ways to success. Just some of them have more risk. So if you want the least risk, then my recommendation is like prototype it. Don't write a single line of code and go, go get a tool like Figma and just have a designer, like make it all where you can actually click on the mouse and it goes to the next page and you can type in. It, it kind of feels like a, it's like a no code prototype. 
You can have right. people build these like on Upwork and they're, they're pretty easy to put together and they don't have to be pretty. And if the customer, you know, the customer wants to pay you and then you have them use it and then they use it like, oh, this is incredible. We're, we're like one step closer to what you need to build. Because if you don't do that step and then you start writing code, front end, back end, the cost to make a change goes up. The amount of time required to make a change is longer. So we want to just iterate at like, make it go small and then go big. Like we don't need to go right to write in code. If you really want to de-risk it, take another crack on a no code prototype. And you, the, the, you can do the equivalent of this in a service-based business as well. But the point's the same. It's just lots of little iterations. And then when we're super sure, then go have them go do the things equivalent to writing code. Or the if you have a physical product and like before you go to tool up the manufacturing line and go find a vendor in China to start making stuff for you, maybe like take some pre preliminary steps before that, you know? So that's what I mean, speed of execution. And, and just most things don't matter. And most of the things you're going to try aren't going to work. So just go faster, iterate. Uh, it's not an excuse to like, to like not think though, to not be creative. There's right. a difference. That's this combination of good creative thinking and good execution. The, the other thing I was going to say that I, I love as a principle is um, my friend, Jesse Elder likes to ask the question, you know, Hey, wh where does money come from? You know, people say, Oh, it comes from creating value or it comes from paper or whatever. And then you know, ultimately he gets to the point that money comes from other people's bank accounts. Right. If you want to be in business, you need to know how to get money out of other people's bank accounts and into yours. Like that's where the rubber meets the road. And so we can get hung up on like logos and doing like, like business cards and t-shirts and mugs and websites and social media handles. It's like cool. And at some point you have to confront the reality that money comes from other people's bank accounts. And the sooner you start moving in that direction, the better, which is why I love that you charge before you built. So I think those four principles are good. Those are good uh, four squares to think about as you build. That's fantastic. Okay. So now you wake up one day and you think, well, there's a lot to do in AI. It's a huge, huge industry. <laughs> it's a huge thing, right? And you're seeing like startup after startup right now in AI. Why, of all things, automated newsletters? Yeah, I um, love that question. The last company that we sold was a SaaS company in uh, the cannabis industry. So we didn't touch the plant. We built software that did compliance and helped um, the states track where the plants were, you know, et cetera. And, um, you know, in that industry, we couldn't buy ads. It was a regulated market. You can't buy ads for anything that has anything related to cannabis. You just can't. Um, and even social media, they, they sort of nerf your posts to the point where they're basically, unless people are looking for you, they're not going to find it. So right. the way we, we took that company from 900K in annual recurring revenue to 8 million in less than three years during the pandemic. And we did that through direct mail and email. Now I realized that like you know, email is such, it's a beautiful tool. I, I give these talks all over the country and I say, hey, raise your hand if your business uses email and hundred percent of the hands go up and I say, keep your hand in the air if your business uses TikTok and about 90% of the hands go down. And I realize I'm sort of right. picking TikTok a little bit, but it's like everybody uses email. It's it's the killer app. It, it still has more daily active users than any single social media platform on the planet. So love it or hate it, it's still how businesses communicate with themselves, with their marketplace. And so what I realized from our last company, Growflow, is that email is this huge white space of innovation. People, everyone wants to build the next great thing, um, but the email is still this great opportunity to innovate. And so we kind of made this joke and we said, uh, we called it Project Mega, make email great again. You know, it was like a tongue in cheek. Yeah, shape. yeah. Yeah. So I said, well, what, what would that look like? And so I, when we were selling the last company, um, you know, that process takes months and I kind of knew it was going to take months. So I started asking around to friends, hey, hey, who's working on interesting stuff? And I'm, I'm kind of excited about email. There's a pretty small pool of people doing that, but I got introduced to Evan Pagan and my other business partner, Dr. Peter Diamandez, and they had had some thoughts around using machine learning to basically curate news to be able to predict the future. Uh, Peter runs this thing called PhD Ventures, and he, you know, he funds a lot of ideas that come out of it. So I met with them and we originally had talked about me coming on to help them, you know, turn it into a real business. So I came on as a co-founder, eventually joined as CEO, but I had a bit of a different vision for the company given my experience from Growflow. And I said, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could help small business owners, which means your brand or your company has less than hundred employees. That's the vast majority of businesses in the English speaking world, right? Um, right. What, what, if, uh, what if we could really just like 
you know, help people with email, because here's the facts, like 80% of SMBs, people with less than hundred employees use email as their primary acquisition and retention channel. But uh, they spend, you know, multiple weeks, over 50% of them spend one to three weeks writing a single marketing email, not days, not hours, weeks. A third of that time is spent on what do I put in the email? What do I even put in here, right? So that was a huge problem. And then we saw this massive Cambrian explosion of AI tools hit the market. Well, we were early, we were like 2021 when we started developing this. And I said, wouldn't it be cool if we could use machine learning to go ahead and help people with that problem? Yeah, so we built a, we built a very cool piece of technology that uses machine learning to go out and curate the world's most interesting information, put it into a newsletter, summarize all that content in your voice, put your ads for stuff that you're selling and your own content in there and send it to your customers every day, every week, every month, whatever cadence you want. And the AI does 99% of the heavy lifting. And then we stick a human in the middle just to verify it. Why? Because we look at AI as like a really, really, really good intern, but we don't ship intern work to the marketplace. So, you know, AI plus human is sort of the best outcome. Um, So long-winded answer, but that's why email... You know, that's, that's, that's why we're doing this is it's like this, this email space. And for us folks have less than hundred employees, it, we're neglected. There's so many, there's so much more money we could be making with so much less effort. And we think that uh, we're going to be the ones to do that or help people. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're in a mastermind together, uh, genius network owned by Joe Polish, and he uses this technology and I get the emails once a week. From, Do- from Joe. I know he didn't write a word of it. And yet I can't help but wonder, how is he figuring out this is all the same content and all the same links and all the information? Like, I like it. It's, <laughs> it speaks to me. It's like everything that I'm interested in. How is it doing that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we use something called adaptive learning. Um, uh, basically, every time someone opens the email or clicks on it, we're looking at an individual level and at a group level. Like, what are they opening? When are they opening it? What stuff are they clicking on? What content categories are interesting? Uh, what specifically in the content is interesting to them? And the newsletter is smart. So it gets smarter and smarter and smarter the more the audience engages with it. Um, so it's not just for Mark. It's I, I read the newsletter too. I read Joe's newsletter. Um, and you know, it just learns from what all, what we're all clicking on, and it makes tr- really complicated trade off decisions. Because it'd be easy if it was just Mark, we we'll just give you what Mark wants. But we need to make a newsletter that that threads the needle of what Mark and Joe and thousands and thousands of other people are clicking on in that newsletter. And that's why it gets better. That's why it feels like it knows you and it knows what you like because it's learning from how you interact with it, not just you, but all of us. So it's uh we don't, we, in some ways we, we don't call our, we don't call these newsletters internally. We call them interest letters because they're pulled yeah. from the interest of the audience, right? As much as they are pushed down from the publisher. That's a totally different way of thinking about email. It's like, how do we build for what the audience wants instead of guessing? And that's a huge part of how we're able to get such good open rates. The average open rate, this is not like a marketing stat, is between 40 and 60% open rates. If you have less than a 40% open rate and you're one of our publishers, that's what we call our customers, we know you're like, there's something wrong. So I'll like assign someone on my team to go figure out like, well, what's going on here? Let's fix that. You know, whereas most people's open rates are like, you know, eight to 15% if you're lucky, maybe 20% if you're doing really, really well. So, you know, yeah. our bar is a lot higher. And if you have really high resonance, like if like Chris Foss's newsletter, I mean, I don't want to put his stats in, in, the, in the public, but, you know, very high open rates. We also just launched uh, Dan Sullivan's newsletter, The Spark, very, very high open rates. I mean, like, like his audience loves him and his stuff already. So we're able to just multiply uh, what's already there. That's crazy. But okay, but AI is moving so quickly. Yeah. And so yeah. what what keeps you up at night about this? Because I could imagine there was going to be someone you know, some indie coder or some big I don't know, division of Microsoft that looks, "Oh, daily AI is doing this is this is interesting. Let's just do it." And yeah. or whatever. Right. Yeah. I mean, are, are are these real risks in the marketplace? Like what are the what are the risks? What keeps you up at night with AI? Um that like competitive stuff doesn't really keep me up at night because the things that make us special, you know, we have IP protection around that. And, you know, 
most big companies don't want to go after the small, you know, really small business segment that's sort of neglected, which is why it's why we we're happy to do it. Um, so I think it'd just be much easier for Microsoft to buy us. So thankfully Microsoft, if you're listening to this, we'd be happy to have that conversation at some point. Um, anyway, so, uh, yeah, what keeps me up at night about AI is actually, um, uh, I, there's two camps, roughly speaking, in humanity on AI. You've got one camp, which is like, I'm a maximalist. I think it's going to accelerate and make everything easier and become our thought partner and extension of our consciousness and intelligence. And it's going to be extraordinary. Then you've got like the, the doomers that think it's going to bring about our destruction. And, uh, you know, uh, Dan Sullivan said something that I really appreciated in, in the mastermind that I'm in with him, uh, a genius network, basically, the one that we're both in. And yeah. uh, he said, you know, we're really bad at predicting the future as a species. And I agree with that. I mean, we're like, some of us are better than others in, in a short enough time frame, but extend it out long enough and we're just bad at it. But we're really good at assigning meaning, meaning that like whatever future you think is going to happen is in some ways the meaning you're assigning to what's going to happen. And so if right. you're like doomer, sort of gloom and doom person, you might think the sky is falling. And if you're like an optimist, you might think everything's great. Um, so I sort of choose the meaning that AI is going to be an incredible accelerant to us. And I think that um, much like electricity, it, it's going to dramatically change everything in the way that we do it. But we're going to adopt AI way faster than we will have adopted electricity. Um, you know, there's still places on the planet that don't have electricity, which is um, you know shocking to us in the Western world. But it is what it is. I think AI will permeate the, the people with the electricity much faster. And so, um, yeah, the thing that kind of keeps me up at night is yeah, like the only way to win in this game is speed like real fast, like customer acquisition and going really fast. Cause like technologically it's very difficult to build a moat. So yeah, it's uh, how fast can we go? And uh, I think there's a fast way and a right way. And so the discernment of like, what is that for us? That's a, that's a legitimate concern that we wrestle with as a leadership team all the time. So. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, and after building teams, doing startups from a leadership perspective, what mental models do you use when you think about that discernment of going fast and doing yeah. it the right way? Um, we can only go as fast as uh, our customers are willing to go. So today yeah. we, we have the technical capability to send a personalized individual newsletter to every single subscriber on the list, but publishers don't want that. They don't have time to review 5,000 versions of their email. They want to see one version, approve it, and then send it to everybody. So, you know, we want to do the best thing on behalf of our customers at the speed with which our customers are willing to go. So, you know, that's, that's a, uh, call it a constraint or a reality that we live in. Um, but you know, the, the mental, some of the mental models that, um, that I think are really important is same thing, man, put the customer first. If we can put the customer first and optimize for their outcomes, money is no problem. Like they'll pay us, right? If we can get you we have a saying in our company, outcomes over outputs, meaning like anybody can get an output out of chat GPT or mid journey or any of these AI tools, but if it doesn't get the customer an outcome, oh, better open rate, better clicks, more ads, more book calls booked, more, more sales, then it doesn't matter. It's just like a giant rush of you know novelty and dopamine. I can get that from watching Netflix, you know, and so can you. We might as well work on things that are going to move the needle. So yeah, we're really focused on outcomes. That's a big, big mental model that we hammer on. Put the customer first, focus on what's good for them, measure measurable outcomes for them. You know, and the last thing is just um, as a leader, like I think our jobs as leaders is to like create a potential future reality that doesn't exist and then recruit, you know, people and money and resources and go make it happen, right? And so at yeah. the end of the day, uh, no matter what's happening, what is the vision that we have for the company and how as a leader, am I helping the team collectively define reality? And um, it's really challenging and interesting uh, doing this versus what I've ever, anything I've done in the past because it changes so fast. And our, our, our prediction of what the future is gets gets cloudier and clearer, it seems like every other month. And so, but it's it's, how cool is it? We live in a time where we can, chat with like a super intelligence and get instant answers. And even though it hallucinates half the time, it's, it's super cool and it's not getting, you know, quality wise, it's only getting better. So it's what, what a, what a crazy time to be alive and, and to be building in the space. It's really exciting. It's, it's amazing. I mean, I totally agree with you. It's the best time ever to be alive. And I really, I mean, I'm so thankful, but my kids, I think 
what a great time to be in ah, your twenties right now so and alive. Yeah, I mean, they they really won the the lottery uh, of life yeah. in in that sense. So uh, yeah, if I if I could just Brian Johnson and stop aging, that would be yeah. uh, amazing. Yeah, you know, I agree with you. Like the future is so cool. It is. And uh, one of the newsletters we make, we made it um, in our beta program last year, you know, Tony Robbins and Peter Diamandis launched a book called Life Force. And we made a um, the companion AI newsletter for that thing. It's called Longevity Insider. So if you go to longevityinsider.org and you're into longevity, five days a week, Monday through Friday, it will curate the latest longevity breakthroughs. Uh, and summarize all of them for you in a daily email that we've got about 42,000 subs on that. It's got a 54% open rate. So 20,000 people read it five days a week. It's awesome. So if you're into living forever, I'll uh, Brian Johnson, this is like all the latest and greatest cool stuff there. So a little plug for that. Uh, yeah, definitely. I'll, yeah, that's, that could be your tip of the week, but no, <laughs> I'm going to ask you something else. So you, you know, you gave us great advice in the beginning. Um, I want to flip it and say, and just ask you, what's the worst advice you see or hear given in the world of startups or entrepreneurship or even in AI? Yeah. Um, wow. What a great question. I, I think, um, I think the advice that is the least useful is if it comes from like a, a mental model or a headspace of one right way thinking, right? Meaning like, like I'll give you an example. I'll try to condense this. There's kind of like three ways of looking at the world from a what's true perspective. There's the moral perspective. There's like the scientific logical perspective. And then there's the intuitive perspective. There's more than these, but let's just say that. So if I meet somebody that's like really high, strong on the moral perspective, I, I don't want to make them wrong, but I'm probably going to discount what they have to say because it's just pretty one dimensional. If I meet somebody, uh, which I did recently and, and, and all like they're like an empiricist and all they can see is through the eyes of what's provable through science. It's, it's not that they're wrong. It's just that like, they're only seeing reality through one dimension. And if I meet someone that's like, Oh, you know, this is my, how I feel about it. And my intuition, I, I, I think that can be powerful. I also think that that's one dimensional. So I try to go to the root of like, where's this coming from? Is, is, is this person taking what I call a multi perspectival approach to the world? And does that, does the advice reflect that? And if it does, then I'm very interested in what they have to say. I'm like, Ooh, this, whether they know it or not, this person's on to this truth stuff. They, they may have a better view of the world than I do. And then I, I try to become a student and then listen to them. So just principally, that's a filter I use to evaluate all advice. And if somebody has like a really high conviction rate on everything that they say, like everything's like, Oh, that's definitely this. And it's definitely that. Then I'm like, oh, are you sure, man? Cause like everything in its excess becomes its opposite. And it's rare that things are definitely a hundred percent the way they're tr true or the way they're purported. And so it, I've just learned to take, have a healthy skepticism to kind of the one right way thinking. It just, it, it's, it's it, probably good in spirit, but it doesn't usually pan out in reality. So um, yeah. that's like my universal law and that's right. A hundred percent of the time. No, that's, that's just how I think about people's advice. If that's helpful. But other than that, you know, I think that just specifically to AI, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of, um, I would just caution, um, people, you know, like AI is extraordinary. And by the time you're listening to this, this won't age well, because maybe you listen to this in two or three years and the, the capabilities of AI will certainly be exponentially better. But at the time of this recording, there's a lot of promise in AI, like, oh, you can automate this and it's going to, you know, make you a bunch of money and it's just push some buttons. And it's like anything that's like the easy button. It's not the easy, it's not yet. It's not there yet. It, need, it needs right. a lot of good TLC and parameters and framing or human help. So at the time of this recording, like I don't, there is no whiz bang, push one button, all your problems go away with AI. Not yet, but but right as of right now, you know, at the time of this recording, it, that's not here yet. So I, I think that's generally when I hear that, I don't know if it's bad advice, but I definitely know you're trying to sell me something. Yeah. I mean, you know, the thing is, and I don't know if this is going to change, but Throughout history, nothing worth doing has been easy. Yeah. And the tools and the technology have gotten better and better, and we've gotten smarter and we've evolved, and it's still nothing is easy. Now, there's people out there like you know you or Peter Diamandis, right, that might make it look easy, but I think if we looked at how you guys work day to day, it ain't easy, <laughs> right? That's right. And so yeah. I, I don't, I just think, I just think it's just going to be another tool to help us. But at the end of the day, it's, 
you know, there, it's still going to take human uh, can do this and ingenuity and, and a whole bunch of other skill sets to, to really break into a very competitive marketplace. I agree. And yeah, but, um, well, Joe, this is, this has been fantastic. And your, your mentorship has been absolutely invaluable, but now we're at that point in the podcast where I'm going to ask you for your tip of the week, a book, a resource, a website, something else actionable for the art of passive income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? All right, here we go. So um, my tip of the week is it's not like a book or anything. It's if you if you aren't on a tool like ChatGPT, get on ChatGPT or Bard, just Google it, find it, sign up for the free version. And if you're intimidated by AI, um, I want to give you a tip. The tip is this. If you've got a lot of experience in a domain or an industry or a specific part of your life, and you've got frameworks and mental models and ways of thinking about it because you've gone really deep and learned a lot about it and you have a lot of experience there, that's actually going to make you a better partner with uh, these generative chatbots, these AI tools. And so you can bring those to the party and get a lot better outcomes than a young person who's more willing to take the tool, but doesn't know how to tie their shoes in your industry and doesn't have your experience. So I mean, a lot of people who are almost discouraged, they're like, you know, I can spell AI, but I really don't know how to use it or what it means. It's like, well, you don't really need to, all you need to learn has to have a conversation and how to bring your knowledge to the party and then interact with it in a way to help you, uh, you know, do whatever you're doing, whatever tasks you're doing. And so I just wanted to give you encouragement. Like if you're not using these tools, please use the tools. It's a bit like not using electricity after it came out and it's easily accessible and free in many cases. And just know that like you're, if you have experience and domain expertise, it's not, you're ahead of the curve. You're not behind it and be encouraged and bring that experience into the chat experience um, to learn and to, to grow and to use those mental models to get better outputs and to just, you know, if anything, just learn how to use AI. It's it's a fascinating technology. It's going to change all of our lives. And yeah, that's my advice. That's my tip of the week. I love it. I love it. Don't be intimidated. Use your your depth of knowledge uh, with these tools. Well, you know, Joe, that's a good tip of the week, but it's not going to make anybody any real money because my tip of the week will. <laughs> Great. And my tip of the week is go to daily www.daily.ai. And with my Midwestern accent, maybe you don't know how to spell daily, or maybe I don't know how to pronounce daily, D-A-I-L-Y, like every day, daily.ai. And imagine getting those types of open rates. If it, if your land is, you can sell a piece of land every week, maybe every day, because you're engaging, you're building so much uh, you know, goodwill with your audience because you're giving them exactly what they want. And yeah, you can throw in an ad or two in there as well. And there, there's not going to be that that feeling of, oh, this person's just spamming me with their newsletter because it's curated for exactly what they want to read. It's insane. And Joe, how long does it take to make? Um, well, here's the best part. Uh, you fill out a survey and you go on a 45-minute call and our team does all the work for you. So not, not much time at all, maybe total and 45, an hour of your time max. And then our team will set your newsletter up. Do it. We basically do it all for you. So it's a very little time investment on your half. Yeah. So for the ambitiously lazy, which I know if you're listening to this podcast and you're interested in passive income, you absolutely are. We can always make more money. We can't get more time. You owe it to yourself. Even if you're not in the land business, you have some other business where you're doing marketing to an email list. And I know you are. Go to daily.ai. Joe Stolte, this has been a phenomenal conversation. Uh, is there anything I should have asked you I didn't ask you? Well, I, I will say this. Um, anybody that mentions the podcast, if you come to the website and you book a demo and sign up, if you mention the name of the podcast uh, when you purchase, uh, we'll include a free 90-minute training that shows you how we use these chat tools like ChatGPT and Bard, how we use them in our business. So you can send someone on your team or you can learn them. Um, and this is exactly how we save hundreds and hundreds of hours every month. We have about a, we have a nine-person team doing the work of 30. And I'm going to show you in that training how we're using these tools in very, very simple ways to get 
lots of time saved. And so uh, as like a bonus, just for hanging out with us today, I'm happy to throw that in the hat and give it to you for free. Joe, that is so generous. Thank you so much. Well, uh, I do want to remind the listeners that the only way I'm going to get the quality of guests like a Joe Stolte to come on the podcast is if you do three little, three little favors, follow, rate, review the podcast, send us a screenshot of that review, support at thelandgeek.com, and I'm going to send you a signed copy of Dirt Rich. But just do it for yourself selfishly because then Joe will come back and be like, oh, look at all the reviews on Auto Passive Income Podcast. I'll come back. So so even if you don't want the book, you've read the book, uh, that'd be really helpful. Just quick reminder, if you're looking to build your passive income, you want to go up that mountain of land investing safely, quickly, and efficiently with someone who's done it thousands of times, you owe it to yourself to learn more about flight school. So just go to thelandgeek.com forward slash training, schedule a call to learn more. I know what you're thinking, oh, you know, what about the the tuition to flight school? It ain't going to cost you nothing. Guaranteed you're going to make that money back 180 days or less. Just show us your work. So you've got everything to gain, nothing to lose. Thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Joe Stolte, this has been amazing. I want to thank the listeners and uh, let freedom ring. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Are you ready to learn how you can start building a passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents? Schedule a free consultation at thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Let freedom ring.